always find myself uh, coming back to this phrase. I heard it once in, I don't know, in an interview on a podcast or something. And um, it, uh, this pastor said that uh, effectiveness is okay, but we're not called to effectiveness. We're called to faithfulness. And I really love that Kajani Farm just continues to be faithful in what God has called, even when maybe it doesn't seem like it makes sense, even when it wouldn't maybe be effective. Um, so, kids, you are dismissed. You can go and have some fun down in children's church and learn some stuff. <laughs> yes. I feel like some of the parents are thinking that same thing with me being up here. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Michael Allen. I am the associate pastor here, um, and I'm really excited to talk to you. I say this, I feel like, every time, but it never stops being true. I'm really excited to talk to you about the Word of God. Um, I'm shuffling because I don't know what I'm doing and stuff. But I, uh, Dave and I have been really excited to four growth groups in September, and we're really excited to, to bring this to you and go through this series called Grow. In fact, this is something that is so incredibly exciting to me that I can often ramble and like I get super uh, amped about it, and so I just keep going and going. So I'm going to do you all a favor. I'm going to set a timer for myself. I have a clock there, but I have a, I'm going to set a timer right here. Does an hour and a half seem good to everybody? Just kidding. So we have been shifting to uh, for this month of August into looking at growth groups and growing together in a deep and meaningful way. And I'm really thankful to uh, Lee Eklov, who recommended to Dave and I that if we really, truly, deeply, which we do care about uh, growth groups succeeding, he recommended take, take those four weeks to really launch it well. And so that's what we're hoping to do. That's what we're praying to do. So thank you, Lee, for that, that suggestion. Um, I'm so grateful. I'm so nervous that he's here. He often skips my messages. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I feel like he's sitting back there with a notepad. Um, <laughs> But we, we wanted to take four weeks to just start to, to break the surface. Even across four weeks of messages, we can't tell you everything, the nuances and the, the importance of it. But I want to share with you today a little bit about our, our desire to grow in humility. And when we grow in Christ, when we're growing together, this is going to be something that we, we see all, all throughout Scripture. We're going to just look at a few places where this is a call for us to grow in humility. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the, the Western culture, probably other cultures, I would venture to guess every culture, but I only know the Western culture, we are not known for being humble, right? We're pretty sure of ourselves. We know the best way to maybe run a government, maybe not, maybe not, right? But we, we know that, that we have the, maybe the best way of running an economy, maybe not, right? But we're very sure of these things. We know maybe the best way to parent. In fact, often many of us have either experienced or seen or been this person who you're in a store and you're, you have a young child or you pass a young child who's really, really fussy and we've seen this thing where everyone knows what the right thing to do in that moment is to tell that parent how they should be parenting, right? Yeah, everyone who's laughing is a parent who's experienced it, right? It, we're very, very, very bad at being humble, and I think that one of the places where this most frequently plays out is when we think about our emotional interactions. The, the life that we live is a very emotional life. And culture, broadly, consistently across time, chooses these kind of accepted ideas, these social norms, if you will, about what's acceptable among friends or among family. M men in the U.S., are often told things like crying is maybe too feminine or it's too weak. You're not allowed to cry. Man up. Get over it. Suck it up. Move on. But they're also told like being aggressive or, or intense or really driven, like that's acceptable, right? That's okay. Women are often told like being nurturing and, and caring and motherly are, is an appropriate thing, but to be strong and opinionated and driven is, ah, no, that's not, no, no, no. That's not, not what we want from you. And this idea of, of telling us that we need to fall into certain expectations of emotional reality when the truth is that we all experience all of those emotions is something that, that just across time and across cultures has been 
put on us, and we often find ourselves formed and discipled more by our culture sometimes than by Scripture. I think that when we think about emotions, we, we serve, we worship a, an emotional God. Now hear me. I'm not saying that he's a God who is formed by his emotions. We are formed by our emotions, right? We get angry and we start screaming, right? Or, or we start to get passive aggressive or we get happy and we cheer like a, 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 a cheerleader. I couldn't think of anything for that one. <laughs> I'm not going to ad-lib for the rest of this after that. Um, but we have a God who feels feelings. He delights in his chosen people. That's joy. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. That's sorrow. We read often, and it's people's maybe least favorite places to go in the Old Testament, but we read often of God's righteous anger. These emotions come from a place of perfect love, of perfect justice, of perfect holiness, but God feels them nonetheless. And you, brothers and sisters, are made in his image, which means you feel them too. And you are not told by Scripture to pretend you don't. In fact, you shouldn't. When we're told by those around us, right, that, you know, oh, don't cry, your emotions are too feminine, or don't speak your mind, that's, that's too strong of, a, of, a, of a, an emotional stance, that's not a biblical perspective. Can I just say that? When we look at Scripture, we see emotion present all over the place. Sometimes it's demonstrated in a negative way and sometimes in a positive way, but you can't read through the book of Psalms without seeing uh, the fear, anger, joy, sorrow of David and the other worship leaders. Jesus, who was both fully God and fully human, wept. Think about that the next time you say to yourself or you say to somebody else or you hear somebody saying to you, well, men don't cry. Oh, so are you saying then that Jesus isn't a man? Tell me more about this heresy. <laughs> don't respond like that. No one responds well. But Jesus wept. In fact, when, when Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane in the book of Matthew, he says to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Maybe some of you have experienced times like that where you just feel like everything is crashing down around you. You are so sad and waiting that it is just better to die. But you can't tell anyone because to do that would be weak. I believe that the reason, there's two kind of umbrella reasons that I feel like we don't share our emotions, right? These are kind of umbrella reasons, but I think that it comes down to this. I think it comes down to pride and fear. Pride and fear. And I don't think it's often like it's only pride or it's only fear. I think they kind of get smushed together like this, and it gets hard to differentiate which part of this emotional reaction is pride and which one is fear. I think that uh, we respond with pride when we're talking to our parents growing up. I know what I'm doing. It's fine. Then our parents start to get mad, and we start to respond with fear. I know what I'm doing. It's fine. We're afraid of admitting to our friend that they hurt us they offended us. Again, to do so would maybe be seen as weak. Maybe we're worried about possibly seeming politically correct because that's a horrible thing. Or maybe we just don't think it should matter. There's, there's more difficult situations happening in the world. Why does my little offense matter? I don't want to seem like I have thin skin. We're afraid to admit that we don't know the next step to take. I have all these options in front of me and I don't know which one I should take, which one is the most God-honoring. Or maybe you don't see what the next step is. You're like, I don't even know. I feel like I'm stepping out over an empty chasm and I have no idea what's there. We're afraid to admit that we're broken, that we're sinners, that we're stuck in cycles of addiction or lying or aggression. Because to do that might cause people to question my identity. Well, are you really... Are you really a believer if you're feeling that? Perhaps for you, pride rings more true, right? Perhaps, perhaps you, you think to yourself, like, I don't need to express my emotions because I got it, right? I can handle it. I have my retail therapy. I have my food therapy. I have my gym therapy. I, have my, I can find another project in the garage to do so I don't have to deal with my feelings therapy. I'm big enough. I'm tough enough. I'm mature enough to handle it on my own 
I don't want it's, to, it's not somebody else's burden to bear. It's mine to bear. I'm going to deal with it. I don't need their pity. And I think all of this comes down to, I think that the, the first thing to know is that the thing that cuts through this, the, the feeling that cuts through this is humility. Humility will cause you, will force you to Christ, which we're going to talk about in a second, but it's going to, going to force you to recognize that your pride means nothing. And your fear is overcome. Jeremiah 9 says, This is what the Lord says, Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, I find joy. So before we get into the actual body of the message, I just want to invite you today, if you haven't gone there yet, I want to invite you into the presence of Jesus. Maybe you're just weighed down with pride that you can't carry anymore, with fear that you can't carry anymore. Scripture tells us in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our first recourse, even though we're going to be talking about growth groups through this, our first recourse is Jesus. We have the blessing of a God who dwelled with us bodily and he continues to dwell with us and within us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want you to not experience emotion. That's not, this passage isn't saying pretend like those anxious feelings don't exist. He's saying bring them to me. Let me carry them. Matthew 11, one of my favorite passages for this. Jesus has come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So many of us, we just need rest from trying to be something that maybe our parents or our spouses or our children or our culture or our society is telling us we should be. So maybe you haven't experienced the presence of Jesus before. You haven't fallen into his grace, and I want to invite you there. But the beautiful thing is that this isn't just a spiritual, intangible option that happens in our brain for us, right? Because Jesus gave us something practical on this planet to help with this, his church, you, me. We've said this before, but the church, biblically speaking, doesn't, doesn't mean this building or this Sunday event, right? It's the, it's the people. We are the church, and we use the word church to sy- kind of synonymously mean the event that happens on the weekend or the building itself. But you are the church, We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. And this is also then a very real, albeit imperfect, this side of eternity, manifestation of the kingdom of God. Like that song that we sang. Right? We are the church. We're intended to be a shelter for the needy, help to the poor, defenders of justice, and imperfect proclaimers of righteousness and gospel. And growth groups become an extension of the church body. This isn't a replacement for it. It's not a check mark that we're asking you to be like, okay, here's one more thing that you have to do on a legalistic list of stuff. No, we think that growth groups have a really specific purpose, and it comes down to discipleship, which we'll hit at the end, but it's a place where we get to be known deeply, fully, and loved. Because you, you are all imperfect sinners. I am an imperfect sinner. And in the church, we will deeply and truly know each other and love each other in the way that we were intended and designed by God to do. Dave referenced a bunch of scriptures last week, but the one that I, I loved was that we shared the foundation of the gospel 
but we share our lives. We can't weep with those who weep unless we know that they desire to. So last week, Dave talked about how we're designed, to, uh, we're designed for, we thrive in, and we are to commit to fellowship. And so I want to recall that passage from 1 John that he referenced, 1 John 1. We're going to go verses 5 through 10. John says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And then he kind of does this weird thing where he says, but if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So he's not saying when you come to Jesus, when you move into this fellowship, all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom, you stop sinning. You are no longer angry. You are no longer prideful. You are no longer a liar. You are no longer a cheat. He's saying, no, 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 no. God took that. He took the weight of that. You're not, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we can't claim that we're without sin. There's work to be done still. And we're to confess our sins. But notice where this starts. Fellowship begins with Christ. It can't start anyplace else. It begins with Christ. I really believe both because of my lived experience and what Scripture shows, that you cannot have meaningful fellowship that goes soul deep, that goes to that spiritual level without Christ. But I also believe that you can't have Christ without that meaningful fellowship. A really good example is Kajani Farms. Just thinking through what Heather was talking about, when they wanted to give up, when it got hard, we're distant but we're still in this family and our fellowship through our giving, through our prayers, through our support provide assistance. Not so that we can be like, wow, we're so cool, look at us, but so that we can say, look at how good God is. That he gives us each other to do this. This fellowship idea is not an optional accessory to the Christian life. It's not something that you get to say, oh, well, you know, it's me and my Bible. That's that's all I need got to have fellowship. You're not called to come to church once a week and then stay sequestered in your house away from the saints the remainder of the week, away from the world the rest of the week, right? When you come to Jesus, you don't just come to the personal and intimate God. You also come into the fellowship of the saints. You come into the body, into the family. And this might look different for different churches and different people in different cultures, but in the United States, what we usually want it to look like when, when we think about this is we go, well, I say, I say hi to them on Sunday morning in the common grounds, right? I say hi to them. And then maybe I'll ask them how their week was, follow up on, a, on, a, on something they mentioned last week, and then I go and I find my seat in the sanctuary before somebody else snags it, because that's my seat. You all know. And then we go through our week, our various jobs, Maybe here and there we have some spiritual conversations. Maybe we, maybe we evangelize a little bit. Maybe we even do a weekly Bible study, which I think is great. Please hear me. Please, to use, to use Tom Douglas' thing, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, <laughs> right? But we don't allow ourselves to be fully known because fully known goes beyond just information transfer. It begins with Christ because it has to And when it begins with Christ, we start to recognize that we are sinners who are in need of a Savior who has been provided. And then we gather with other sinners on Sundays because this becomes mutual edification. Did you guys know that when when you come together on Sunday, like the intent of this is not to remain just being spiritually fed by a person speaking from a pulpit. You are intended to be gathering for mutual edification of each other. You sing and praise and whatnot because that becomes a gospel representation so you functionally preach the gospel to each other by your presence here or your presence online typing into the comments. 
And I'm so thankful that we have online services for those who are, who are traveling or who are sick or who are homebound. What a blessing we have to live in technological ages. But we still need to go visit those people. We still need to come back because embodied worship, in person, seeing and hearing somebody's voice as they declare the praises of God, Scripture tells us it's different, but science, neurology, psychology tells us in person, embodied presence is fundamentally different than digital. So we're to meet together, we're to gather together for mutual edification. Now that's a big word. Maybe I shouldn't use that word. So let me go to the, let me go to the word of God. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24 says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, this is often used to refer to, like, to the Sunday gathering, right? You should come to church because we should not neglect to meet together. And now hear me, I fully believe that it is not less than that, but I think it's more than that. Because every time we meet together, there's an opportunity for this. And when we do this intentionally, through the week, through our lives, you all lean into your callings to be a part of the priesthood of believers. The full context of this, these verses, just so you kind of have them in your brain, uh, that writer of Hebrews is talking about this sacrifice, this body that we were given through Jesus, this great priest over the house of God, and that we should draw near and let the full assurance of our faith grab us, and we should hold fast to that. For he who has promised is faithful, and he immediately goes in to let us consider. One of the ways that we hold fast to our faith is by meeting together regularly. You can't stay separate from the body of Christ and and a plan to survive. Proverbs 18 warns us that the one who isolates themselves is seeking selfish desires. How many of you have had work weeks or school weeks or maybe just like week weeks? Right, where, where you really could have used le- like that dose of Christian fellowship in the middle of it. I'm not talking about like just a Bible study. And again, a Bible study is great, but I'm talking about where you like maybe study the word, but also you spend some time like, here's what I am just really struggling with this week. I am beat down and I need prayer and I need uplifting. People to encourage you to pray with you, to pray for you, and then to point you to and remind you of the, of the Savior, of the victory that we have in Christ. This is our desire for growth groups. That they would be built on this foundation of Christ. And I love this verse in, these verses in Hebrews because it tells us that we need to spur one another on. We need to spur one another on. We need to cheer each other on. We need to encourage each other. I'm doing a Dave right now. Do you see this? I'm walking away from the center, right? <laughs> we need to spur one another on. Why do we need cheerleaders in our lives? Why do we need people praying for us? Why do we need people encouraging us and admonishing us and moving us that way? Because we get discouraged. We get beat down. We get it wrong sometimes. And it's okay and it's important to admit that that happens and admit when it happens because you were not asked by God to live this life alone and isolated behind your picket fence with the boundaries of your house where you can order everything you need from Amazon and you never need to interact with another human soul ever. That is not how God built you. That is not what you were created for. I love Amazon. (laughs) So fellowship begins with Christ. And when, once we move there, fellowship begins with humility. Colossians 3 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's us when we believe in Christ, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Notice, just notice, you have responsibility here. You have to put on your clothes. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which 
binds them all together in perfect unity. And the reason why I'm specifically pulling out humility from that that non-exhaustive list that's right there is because I really believe that humility leads to compassionate, uh, compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience. It's really hard not to be compassionate to somebody when you're like, man, I have experienced something really similar to that, and I get what you're going through. It's really hard to, to uh, not be kind to somebody when you're humble enough to be like, woo, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. So I just want to ask you, when someone comes to you with a question about maybe scripture, right, or maybe they share a deep, painful event that occurred recently, a loss, or maybe they confess a sin that they've been struggling with and they're looking for someone to come alongside them, how do you respond? How do you respond? We're called to clothe ourselves in these things. We have work to do. Our call is to respond with these things. Some of us really suck at being compassionate and gentle sometimes. And then then I'll I'll say, and I I know others in here can relate to this, we'll say, well, that's just how God made me. I just say it how it is. As if God hasn't asked us to be leaning into him to be changed into something more. Some of us, we really suck at times, at teaching and admonishing others. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to hurt them. I'm not their, their keeper. I'm not their father. What about my log in my eye? I don't have any recourse to talk to them. As if we're not called to teach and admonish one another. To spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And here's the beauty of, fe- of humility within fellowship. We're all called to live this way towards each other. And so when we think about how scary it is to be humble and admit to somebody, I'm broken, I need prayer, I need help, I need support, I need all of these things, people will imperfectly come alongside you and bear it with you, just like you will bear it with them when they need it. None of us is called to live this life alone. Galatians 6 says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person firmly, harshly, quickly, rapidly, gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. We don't don't get rid of boundaries in our lives to do this. We don't say, oh, well, I'm just going to walk right into the fire as if I myself am Jesus. We, we restore them gently through things like prayer and accountability and getting them into contact with people who maybe are better suited for it, but we restore them gently and we watch ourselves and we carry each other's burdens and in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. We don't mock someone who's caught in sin or caught in deception. We seek to restore them. We're to bear one another's burdens. And it requires so much humility to approach someone and say, I need help. But the church, the body of believers, is supposed to be a place of help a refuge for sinners, not, for our, not because we're the ones doing this work, but in this weird divine human interaction, Christ is working through each of us for his glory. And so our desire for these Sunday gatherings, right, for Sunday church, is that we come here and sing with abandon, not because we're putting on a show or put on a mask or saying, I have it all together and I love Jesus so much and my life is great and absolutely nothing is possibly going wrong at any point in time but that we can praise him because we know that he is faithful and he is good and he has given us people to walk alongside us. Humility in our weakness, humility in our sinfulness, shouldn't incapacitate us. See, God gave you a capacity for a reason because it helps point to the one who is without a capacity. Our lack of capacity and then joining together to create a more full capacity points to, to the perfectly communal Trinitarian God 
to gospel unity. We decrease so that he might increase. So fellowship begins with Christ and fellowship begins with humility, recognizing our need for Christ and our need for each other. And then fellowship begins with prayer. Our growth groups are not going to remove all the sin from your life. Signed up for a growth group? Great. No longer struggling with that anymore. It's not how that works. Growth groups aren't going to magically make you not lonely. Growth groups aren't going to magically make you known deeply and truly. They take time, consistent, regular time together to build vulnerability and openness. We have a lot of people who are married or, or in serious relationships. I just want you to think about the amount of time it took you not necessarily maybe to know that that person was like your person, right? Um, Because some of you will be like, oh, I knew right away. God told me. God told me in youth group to tell her that I was going to marry her. Um, But I want you to think about the time that it took to build the vulnerability and the trust and the openness to make that deeper commitment. It takes time, and that's not a bad thing. It takes repetition. It takes gathering together here and during the week with intention Trust these days don't, doesn't come quick, right? We have, we have a, an epidemic of a lack of trust in the world. And I'll be honest and, and say that I think that a lot of it is, is being driven by, um, I'll lead with grace and say maybe not intentionally or maliciously, but it's being led by corporations that just have an interest in your money. Because what they do is they know that the fastest way to get money is to make you angry, And so they feed into this, and then our sinful brokenness, especially when we're allowing ourselves to be clothed and discipled by Facebook or uh, TikTok or Instagram or news organizations, dare I say organizations like Fox or CNN or any of the far extreme ones, they're all seeking to disciple you because they want your money. It's the free market economy. Meeting together with each other during the week combats that. We get you for an hour and a half, according to my timer. Uh, We get you for an hour and a half here. This is not the fullness of discipleship. But then you go, there's 168 hours in a week, y'all. So if you're here, let's let's say that you're here for three hours. You get here at 9 a.m. for a prayer for the Bible studies that happen, and then you stay all the way till noon. There's 165 hours for the rest of the week where people are trying to speak into you and to get you to align with them and they want you to follow them, not Christ. Growth groups become one more step, another mitigation effort in helping to stand against that. Not because those, those things are bad. I, I love Amazon. I love watching some news. I love reading news. I like being up to date. But you fight lies with wisdom and you do that in community together. When we gather in these groups then, we pray. We talk to each other and we pray for each other, we pray with each other, and we pray scriptures over each other, and we hold fast to the truth that we confess. James 5, starting in verse 13, says, Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray, not figure it out, Not pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Not trust in your own meritocracy efforts. Pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. This doesn't say that you're getting sick because you're sinning. This is saying you are all, we are all together sinners and we need prayer and we need humility to recognize the fact that we are not meant to do this alone. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
And the beautiful thing about that statement for me is that the, the perfectly righteous one, Jesus, is also interceding on your behalf. How much more powerful can you get, right? But that doesn't mean that we don't do this. Fellowship begins with prayer because our humility should force us to confront our need for God who pours out compassion and mercy. We don't pray because we aren't sure if he'll hear us. Some of you may be in your faith walker in that, that part, that time. But we pray because we know he will hear us. We intercede for one another. We pray for one another because that's what you do when you desire for someone you love to be restored. Our humility should drive us to the foot of the cross where next to us are our fellow believers also there, where we can wrap our arms around each other and worship and pray in a humble and powerful declaration that the grave has no hold on us when Jesus does. One of the most restorative practices I've seen in small group ministries is getting to see the Spirit move and empower someone to put a sin of their flesh to to death. There's this this kind of process that happens, and it might take months or even years, or it might be a process of a couple weeks, but that moment from a humble confession where they come into the group and say, guys, I have a problem. I can't carry this anymore. I can't kick this addiction. I can't kick this um, lying. I can't kick whatever the, the sin is, my pride, my anger. I can't carry it anymore. I'm broken. And then they move to this acceptance of prayer and accountability. We pray over them, right? We don't let them sit there. We don't mock them in it. We pray with them and for them. We help them develop ways to clothe themselves while we also clothe ourselves. And then we come alongside and we bear burdens with each other. We might pray like, Lord, we pray for your wisdom and guidance, right? Your supernatural empowerment to stand in the victory of the cross and the power of the empty grave over this battle, whatever it is. To eventually the celebration and testimony of God's work, right? It's been three years since. Three years since I've looked at porn. Three years since I lied to my spouse. Three years since I screamed at my kids. Three years since. And eventually, that'll be an eternity since. I personally, this is my personal view. This does not represent it. Okay, sorry. I I personally think that, that Protestants, that's us, have too low a view of interpersonal confession. And I think a lot of it is attached to our pride and our fear. Well, I had my personal experience with Jesus. I don't, I, I'm good. I, hi, I have my high priest and my intercessor. And you're right, you do. And you also have each other. God hasn't asked you to fight the spiritual fight on your own. He fills you, he empowers you, and he gives you these relationships to cheer for you, right? To spur one another on, to pray for you, to hold you accountable. Because as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I don't know if you guys have ever seen what happens when iron sharpens iron, but like little flecks of iron get chipped off. That could be painful. That could hurt. And yet, it makes the iron sharper. We need help. We need Jesus, we need each other to get those flakes of our sin chopped off of us. Not because of meritocracy, right? Not because we can do it on our own, but because God has given us a blessing that we don't have to do this life alone. Fellowship begins with Christ You can't have true fellowship without Christ. And you can't be in Christ without true, deep fellowship. Fellowship begins with humility. You can't go into relationships thinking you're the tough one. You're the less sinful one. You're the less needy one. Apostle Paul, anybody heard about him? He boasted in his weakness, not because he enjoyed it. 
In fact, he prayed three times that it would be removed before he recognized that it is something that God was giving him to teach him and to grow him. Paul boasted in his weakness because God's power is magnified, is uplifted, it's magnified in its presence to others when we boast in our weakness but in God's power. Our lack of capacity but God's infinite capacity. Fellowship begins with humility. And fellowship begins with prayer. You can't know Jesus without prayer. I love what Ashley shared earlier. And there are a few things, friends, more humbling than asking for prayer and praying with somebody or for somebody. Few things. I highly encourage you, if you haven't made it to one of our prayer sessions Sunday morning, 9 a.m., right out there, uh, Monday nights, right out there, once a month, first sat- Sunday of every month, down in the fellowship hall. It's a time of deep fellowship together. So I want to just end real quick. This is kind of just really practical, talking about what growth groups are. Because a lot of you might be wondering, like, okay, you keep talking about growth groups. What are they going to look like? What do we do? How do we, right? We're going we're gonna to be kind of releasing more information. On the back of your, of your notes, if you grab them, there's a real small, small, small bullet list um, just of some pieces of information. But you might be asking yourself, like, okay, why growth groups, right? Why can't we just do this naturally on our own, right, as God is leading us? Why do, we, why do we need a ministry? Why do we need somebody to tell us to meet together? Why are you asking us to do this new thing and sacrifice two hours of my week somewhere else where I could be watching sports or doing an, another new Bible study? Why are we asking you to do this? Um, so first, I want to say, if God is leading you to like develop this type of deep relationship with somebody outside of the context of growth group ministry, please do it. Like the growth group ministry doesn't replace the calling of Jesus, right? But I'm going to be real honest and just tell you that the statistics in the, the Western church aren't looking super good about people actually doing this organically. We need help because we're really bad at budgeting. We're really bad at budgeting our money and we're really bad at budgeting our time. The number of times where my wife and I will (laughs) look at a weekend and be like, how do we have five things on this weekend all of a sudden? Like I thought this was supposed to be our, our resting weekend. We're real bad at budgeting time. So first, follow the leading of of the Spirit. But the primary reason for growth groups and why we think it's going to be beneficial and an essential component of our ministry here at Crosspoint moving forward comes down to discipleship. Because discipleship isn't just information transfer. It's not just a pastor telling you what to believe and then all of a sudden you go out and you start living that way. Most of us know that's not actually how we learn. We learn through model and repetition. We have to both see people doing these things often and regularly, and then we start to imitate. We see this in Scripture when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You should imitate each other as each other imitates Christ. So it's not enough just to receive an information transfer. You have to walk and share your life with others. And I just want to say, like, if you're introverted or if you're like, man, I really don't like people, listen, I get it. But please remember, introversion doesn't mean you you don't have deep relationships. It just means that you're not like me where I can have a shallow conversation with somebody for 30 seconds and then move on and they're now my best friend, right? You require time to get to, to know each other. That's scary and I get it. But discipleship is more than just coming and sitting in some pews and receiving data right? Information, thoughts from a, from a pastor and, and worshiping together. It's more than that. It's not less than that, but it's so much more. So, okay, I want to give you a, uh, I'm, I love this subject, so I'm, I'm so thankful for all of you. Um, I want to give a real quick just anecdote that I don't want to turn into another sermon, but I just want you to understand a, a kind of what this idea of is modeled versus information transfer, right? We might learn on a Sunday about lament. 
The pastor may say throughout the sermon something like, when you lose a child or a spouse or a parent, it's one of the hardest things in the world to process emotionally, right? And God wants us to bring that grief and that sorrow to him. He wants us to worship him in that grief and sorrow and not wait until we're through it before we continue to worship. Okay, that's the data. That's the information. That's how, we're, how the pastor is telling us we should act. But then you actually experience a loss. And you've never seen somebody else actually live this out yet. You've never seen what happens when somebody dies well or dies poorly. You've never seen the process of somebody grieving and still worshiping the Lord through it. So discipleship is the data part, the information, but also getting to experience the highs and the lows, the mountains and the valleys with others so that we can learn from each other how to worship Christ through it all. Discipleship is something you experience in the body of believers. It's not just something we do on a weekend. So I want each of us to to move near to Christ and to each other in deep fellowship as we grow in our humility through recognizing our need for a Savior which has been provided. I started this message out by welcoming you uh, to throw yourself on the mercy and the gentility of our Savior if you chose to do that this morning, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I just want you to, to, I just want to welcome you up. We have prayer over here in the corner, and I would love if you just, as, as we get ready for our last song, I would just love if you um, headed over there and asked for prayer. Let us know. Because it's a beautiful moment when all of a sudden you re- realize you are not in this life alone. God didn't make you to be in it alone. He doesn't want you to be at it alone. But he wants you to come to him first. And then we come alongside you and we worship a risen Savior together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us a community that goes beyond just these four walls, or many walls in Cross Point, Lord, but a, a community that moves internationally, a family that goes beyond just Rockford, but you've also given us this local representation, the, these members of this local arm of your church. And I thank you that we have an opportunity coming up to start to really gather together in fellowship to seek the unity, to let your message dwell richly among us, not just on Sundays, Lord, but through every day of the week as different members gather together. I pray, Lord, that growth groups would not just be a checklist item that it would be an opportunity, Lord, for additional worship. That we would spur each other on to love and good deeds and that we would walk in the light and as we do, that we would walk in fellowship with each other. Lord, I thank you for your church. I thank you for your word and I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in this city and in this world. We love you and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.